Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar um, where we are going to be discussing the general data protection regulation from the EU and the Australian Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme. I'm Kate LeMay and I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons. Um, we are, at, are an amalgamation of the Australian National Data Service, NECDAR and RDS, which are three NCRIS facilities and we are um, funded through NCRIST. Um, if you are interested in um, information about uh, where we've come from and where we're going to, please sign up to our newsletter and uh, check out our websites. So I just wanted to quickly um, give a disclaimer that all information that we're going to be speaking about today is of a general nature. If you have any specific uh, questions about your situation, you need to um, seek some legal advice. Uh, we have a great range of speakers today for our webinar and I'm very pleased um, that uh, we've got all of these uh, experts to be able to speak to you. And I'm going to hand over in the interest of time straight to Anna Johnston from Salinger Privacy who's going to uh, start us off today. Thank you, Kate afternoon or good morning for those of you in the West Coast. I am the Director of Salinger Privacy, so we're a specialist privacy consulting training and publications firm. Um, I come from a legal background but I'm no longer practicing as a lawyer so uh, just bear that in mind. As Kate said we're not doing legal advice here today but what I am going to be talking about is the kind of um, privacy law landscape that applies uh, to researchers or people working around research and in particular what issues tend to come up most frequently for people working in the research sector. So um, we, um, you know, some of our, on the consulting side, some of our clients are organisations conducting research projects or quite often now we're seeing lots of, you know, big data, data analytics, um, detailed kind of program evaluations, these sorts of projects coming up that we get asked to advise on in terms of the you know the privacy implications of those and on our training side we also run some workshops on behalf of practice for uh, praxis sorry for um, members of human research ethics committees so on both sides of the business we um, have a fair bit to do with people working in the analytics and, and research space so in this session i'm just going to give um, a kind of tiny taster of the scope of privacy issues that we see coming up often in this context. So what I'm going to be talking about is, as I mentioned, the kind of regulatory landscape and then the most common privacy issues um, and the, the two hot topics we see over and over again are around consent and de-identification of data. A little bit about the new legal privacy developments around GDPR, it's a European privacy law and that, that has reached into Australia and notifiable data breaches and then what, kind of what's coming next um, and then our other speakers will, will speak more about those topics. So we have, if you weren't already aware, we have this kind of patchwork system of privacy laws in Australia. It can start to get quite confusing for a researcher who might be working at um, an institution covered by state privacy laws. So working or supervised at, at a public university, for example, or within the public hospital system. So they're typically covered by state privacy laws, but then say that researcher might be wanting to access data from an organisation covered by a different privacy law, say the Federal Privacy Act, so which covers federal government agencies, um, most private sector businesses, including um, particularly the health sector, all, all uh, private health sector operators, no matter how big or small they are. So, because um, we're talking in this, um, you know, limited time frame we've got today, I'm not going to obviously cover that entire patchwork, but just to recognise that it exists. And in that research space, you are often having to navigate across a mixture of state and federal privacy laws. So. I'm really only just going to talk today, taking as an example, the rule from the Federal Privacy Act about using and disclosing personal information. So um, Australian Privacy Principle, APP6, regulates how personal information can be used or disclosed. So first of all, if you didn't already know, the definition of personal information is incredibly broad. It's not just what you might consider private or sensitive, it's any information or an opinion about an individual who is either identified or reasonably identifiable. So that is the scope of what's covered by personal information, it's incredibly broad. And the Australian Privacy Principles regulate how organisations handle 
the personal information that they've got, they're collecting or holding. So if that organisation wants to use or disclose that personal information, it has to follow APP number six. Um, and this would include, let's say, an organisation being asked to disclose personal information about its patients, its students, its customers to a researcher who might be from within the organisation or somewhere else entirely. So that organisation can use or disclose that personal information for a number of different or under a number of different grounds. The first is if that use or disclosure is for the primary purpose of collection. So uh, let's say that you are a company that sells genes, your primary purpose of collecting information about your customers is to sell them genes. Maybe online you're going to ask what their gene size is, the kind of genes they want to buy, that you take some money, you get a shipping address, you send it out to them. That's your primary purpose. Conducting research into what shoppers like about genes is not part of your primary purpose. Um, the next test is they can use or disclose the personal information for a directly related secondary purpose within the customer's reasonable expectations. So this might include, for example, processing refunds about you know, genes that have been returned because they're the wrong size or whatever. Um, the next reason you can use or disclose personal information is if it is required or authorised by another law. So some other law says you have to or can use or disclose information in some other way. Or if you can't meet one of those first three tests, then you are looking to either you get the person's consent, and we'll talk about in a second what that means, or you need to look for one of a number of public interest exemptions. And there's a whole bunch of other exemptions, national security, law enforcement, find missing person. There's also some research exemptions. So in the context of this rule, some of the common privacy issues I get asked about First of all, is this data we're talking about even personal information? Because this is a real threshold issue. If it's not personal information, you don't need to apply the privacy rules at all. So is it personal information once it's been de-identified? That's one common question. The next is, what does consent mean in practice? How do I get it? What does it look like? And then the third one is, well, what does the research exemption say? How do I meet the tests? So on this first question, it won't be personal information if the data has been de-identified, but what does that actually mean in practice? So I'll, I'll mention shortly this GDPR, the new European privacy law, it actually sets a test which is quite tough. It says um, the privacy law only, uh, uh, sorry, doesn't apply only if you have rendered the data to a point where no one is identifiable at all from it. Whereas the a test under the Australian Federal Privacy Act says personal information has been de-identified and therefore is no longer covered by the privacy rules if the information is no longer about an identifiable individual or an individual who is reasonably identifiable. So under the Australian test, de-identified data is low risk but not zero risk of re-identification. So it's not necessarily meeting the same zero risk test as under European privacy law. So that's something to bear in mind. I think there's a lot of confusion around the what de-identification means. Sometimes it's treated as um, a noun, sometimes it's just a verb if you like. So we, um, and by we I mean sound privacy, our approach is to say de-identification is a process, it's not the end state. So to, you might use the language of to, to de-identify or to anonymise or to confidentialise, it's to do something to the data to try and break that identifiable um, link back to a, an individual. So it's a set of processes. It's not necessarily a promise that it is perfectly anonymous or that, the, uh, that there is zero risk of re-identification. So de-identified data means, in my view, data to which a de-identification process has been applied. It's not necessarily a statement that the data is anonymous or free of privacy risk. When de-identification is useful, um, it's, this, you know, the, its utility is at a number of points. One is if an organisation wants to make its data perfectly anonymous, which is obviously hard to do, but the objective might be to say, well, now we don't need to worry about privacy or Europeans call it data protection law at all. Um, but that's, as I said, very difficult to achieve. 
other reasons why organisations might want to look at de-identification include minimising data security risks. And so, for example, um, when data is in transit between organisations, sometimes it's building into the design of a new system or a process or a database or a technology or whatever it is. Um, and sometimes it's to allow the secondary use or disclosure of information, which is the most likely scenario in research. So um, under GDPR, there's a rule about legitimate interest. It might be easier to meet that test to enable you to use or disclose personal information if you've tried to at least de-identify it. Um, and under some research exemptions, again, differs between states, territories, the federal, um, but often the um, Human Research Ethics Committee, their approval going forward for that project might require the uh, organisation that holds the data to at least attempt to de-identify it before even giving it to the researcher. And almost certainly there'll be a requirement on the researcher to de-identify the results of their research before they publish. Now onto the question of consent. So remembering back to that rule under APP6, an organisation can use or disclose personal information if they have the subject's consent, the person who the information is about. But consent under privacy law, if you're going to rely on that ground to let you use or disclose the personal information, it's quite, um, well the law sets quite a high bar. So to be valid under privacy law, consent must be voluntary, meaning the person was free to say no and not suffer any repercussions. It must be informed and specific. So they need to be told what kind of research is going on here. Um, it needs to be current. You can't rely on something that's too old and obviously given by a person with capacity. So difficult for younger children, adults with acquired brain injury, injury intellectual disability, etc. So in short, co uh, consent must be proactive. Uh, sometimes this is described as opt-in. Consent will only be valid if, as I said, the person was free to say no and they still chose to say yes. So they have to proactively tick a box to say yes, if you like. Um, it must be as easy to withdraw consent as it was to give it. So if they've said yes and then they change their mind and want to say no, you can only still say that you had valid consent if it was easy for them to turn around and change their mind later. So it can't be a condition of doing business with an organisation. So back to my example of the website that sells jeans online, cannot say it is a condition of buying jeans from us that you consent, in inverted commas, for your data to be, you know, used for this research project or to, uh, you know, be shared with Facebook, for example. Consent can only be relied on if the person had the ability to say no and still receive the, the goods or services they were after buying the genes in the first place, for example. So you can't, as a researcher, you can't get someone's consent or infer a customer's consent or a person's consent to something simply because it was included in terms of conditions of a website they used or an app they downloaded. It can't be buried in a collection notice, it can't be buried in an organisation's privacy policy. It has to be a separate proactive opt-in process that the person has quite actively participated in. However, of course, lots of time research won't be on the basis of consent and the research exemptions. So again, I'm taking the Federal Privacy Act example here, often has some rule saying, well, if you can't get consent, which is kind of the gold standard, here's what you need to do next. So a research exemption might say something along the lines of, uh, the researcher needs to demonstrate to the Human Research Ethics Committee, for example, that it is impracticable to seek consent. And again, that, again, that standard's set quite high. So the fact that it's just expensive or inconvenient or a hassle or take some time is usually not enough. The researcher needs to be able to demonstrate that it is going to be at least, in inverted commas, very difficult to find the individuals. So on to um, new developments in privacy law. So under the, again, the Federal Privacy Act in Australia since February this year, we've had a new 
law introduced or an amendment to the law that introduces mandatory notification of data breaches. I'll cover that in a sec. And the other one is, as I've mentioned, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is a European privacy law which has some reach into Australia. So data breach notification first. So the scope of this new law, there's three types of organisations covered by this law, meaning if you have a data breach, you need to follow these new rules. The first is all organisations that hold tax file numbers. Now this is actually almost every organisation you can think of in Australia, because as employers, as organisations employ staff, they collect tax file numbers about the, those staff if nothing else. There's also a whole bunch of organisations that hold tax file numbers for other reasons, like banks, superannuation funds, um, and obviously the tax office. But at, at the very least, lots of organisations hold tax file numbers, and they may be caught by this rule in the Federal Privacy Act, even if the normal privacy principles under that act don't apply to them. So um, state, you know, public hospitals, public universities, as I mentioned before, are um, covered by state privacy law, but to the extent that they hold tax file numbers, they're also covered by this particular part of the Federal Privacy Act. So that's the first category. The second one is credit providers, credit reporting bodies, I'm not going to talk about them. And then the third is any organisations that are known as APP entities, I'll say what they are in a second, um, to the extent that they have a data breach involving personal information. So if you are at a organisation that has a data breach involving tax file numbers, uh, you'll be covered by this if you are an organisation already covered by the APPs in the Privacy Act and if you have a data breach involving any kind of personal information, you'll be covered by these new rules. So APP entities means all Australian government, federal government agencies, um, almost all businesses and non-profits with a turnover of more than $3 million a year. Then we've also got all private sector health service providers, even if they're under that $3 million turnover rule. Um, any organisation that is a contracted service provider to the Commonwealth, again, even if their turnover is less than $3 million. And then some specific organisations covered by anti-money laundering rules. No need to go into that. So what is required? Data breach means loss, unauthorised access or unauthorised disclosure of tax file numbers, credit information or personal information, those three categories. What makes a data breach notifiable is if that data breach is likely to result in serious harm to more than one, sorry, one or more individuals. Um, and what's required is notification as soon as possible to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, this is where the Privacy Commissioner sits, and any affected individuals. And there's some hefty fines for non-compliance. Uh, GDPR has had a lot of hype. This is the new European privacy law. I'm going to go very quickly through this because I can see the um, time's already being used up. There's been a lot of hype. My suggestion is don't believe most of that hype. Um, lots of people claim it's revolutionary. It's going to, we have to treat European citizens differently. Some people think it requires you to get consent for everything. This is not true. Some people believe it's really easy to get consent. You just put it in your terms and conditions, make people click yes. That's also untrue. Um, and there's a belief that this new right to erasure is going to ruin everything, including make research impossible. So just briefly, GDPR as an overview, it's an update of existing privacy laws. It hasn't come completely out of the blue. Uh, but the big changes and the reason it gets lots of attention and lots of hype are the really significant penalties, 20 million euros or 4% of global annual turnover. This is aimed squarely at the big tech companies. Um, and this is the other novel part of it. It has extended reach outside of Europe. But this isn't relating to all data about European citizens. What it actually says is, so if you are an organisation in Australia of any size, small businesses included, but if you offer goods or services to, so you sell genes online to people in the EU, or you monitor the behaviour of people in the EU, if you're doing that actively, proactively, um, then you might be covered by GDPR. I'm going to skip over what GDPR says. I'm going to go straight to um, research under the GDPR. So again, it's 
it's not expressed in the same ways as our Australian privacy principles, but basically it has rules about, we would put it in the language of there's all sorts of rules about the primary purpose for which an organisation might collect and use um, personal data, is the phrase used in Europe. And as long as you've collected and using it under one of these um, grounds, one of which is with consent, um, but there's five other grounds as well, then it says, well, we've got this idea of compatible purposes that will also be allowed, and this includes research in the public interest. Um, it talks about very much that the default position, however, for protecting privacy during a research activity or project will be to aim for anonymisation or at least pseudonymisation. Um, and there's been, as I mentioned, a lot of focus on the right to erasure, but it does not apply to research data. People do have the right to object to their data being used in research. And in that case, the organisation needs to demonstrate that the public interest in the research project outweighs the individual's right to privacy. So that's pretty much it from me, um, except to mention the next big things coming in terms of privacy law in Australia. Um, the federal government, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet is currently drafting a data sharing and release bill. The whole idea is to open up more government held data sets for research. That bill will establish the National Data Commissioner. So the original version talked about the National Data Custodian. I don't know why there's been a change in that title, but it'll be interesting to see how the government sets up the, um, the functions and responsibility of that role. And then we've also got this idea of a consumer data right, so having greater data portability. So just uh, finally from me, from our company, we've got a few different resources that, that um, might be of interest or of benefit to you, and you can have a look at the slides later, no doubt. So thank you for listening to my little spiel, and I'll be hanging around and answering questions later. Thanks for having me. I'm going to very briefly take you through some of our experiences in dealing with the notifiable data breach regime in the context of the page up breach. So this is from Macquarie University's perspective. Why do universities need to comply? Because we're not governed by the Commonwealth Privacy Act. So the notifiable data breach scheme, yes, it is under the Australian Privacy Act. Um, and while we are primarily governed by the New South Wales Privacy and Personal Information Protection Act, the Notifiable Data Breach Scheme, it's applicable to our controlled entities and consequently we decided to proactively adopt the scheme. This is in part because of the significant crossover in systems and people between the university and the controlled entities and it's very hard for external stakeholders to be able to differentiate between the two. So this kind of warranted a consistent approach. So what have we done? So the Notifiable Data Breach Response Plan, that's our sub-plan of our incident and crisis management framework. And it follows the same escalation process as step zero. So we stole most of the, the actual plan from the one that's available from the OAIC, which is actually very helpful. So for step zero, we have four different levels of um, crisis management in terms of our escalation processes. So step level one, a breach is minor and it might already be contained. And then we already just do a notification, usually a business as usual type, um, type instance or a single incident. Level two, it's the breach is significant, but it's contained. We will notify our crisis management team coordinator who will operationalize our crisis and incident response teams as required. Level three, that's an uncontained major incident where the extent is not yet known or the breach is still occurring. So if we've seen some malicious activity occurring on our network, for example, and we're not sure to the extent to which it's actually proceeded. So we'll inform our crisis management team coordinator as soon as possible, and they'll definitely operationalize our um, crisis incident response team. Level four, we call that a critical incident. Um, and obviously inform the coordinator and then we'll operationalize our response team who will then um, respond to our VC as well. So an investigation team will be appointed through each of these phases as well um, with necessary advisors and expertise. Usually in the case of a data breach, we will have the information security manager involved and the privacy officer, so myself. 
The levels that I've just talked you through, they also assist in determining the extent of the investigation and the senior management involvement that's required when responding to an incident. Um, they also, within our crisis management plan, they ensure that our communications are consistent, streamlined, and responsibilities and accountabilities are very clearly defined, including where we're going to actually notify to external stakeholders or whether we're going to um, keep things internal. So, a bit of a background about what happened to Page Up. On the 23rd of May, the malicious activity was detected by Page Up and they launched a forensic investigation quite quickly. Uh, page up went public with a breach on the 5th of June, uh, but they couldn't say at that point whether the client data had actually been compromised at that point. Once the initial forensic investigation was performed, it was actually determined that some personal information was impacted. And this included things like contact details, including name, email address, physical address, and telephone numbers. Um, biographical details, so gender, date of birth, middle name if you have one, uh, nationality and whether you're a local resident at the time of the application. And then employment details as well. So this includes things like the current employment status, company and title, and if your application had gone through to a referee check, then some additional details would have been included in that as well, such as like your technical skills, special skills, the size of the team that you're working in, um, the length of tenure at your company, the reason for leaving that position if it was asked, and the length of the relationship between the application, the applicant and the referee. So some of the more critical data, such as resumes, financial information, your tax file number, and employment reports and contracts, they weren't affected in this instance. So PageUp has several different modules where information is stored, so they weren't able to get to these other modules. Um, so no data included in their new data forms, onboarding or performance and learning modules were actually affected by that. So then on the 18th of June, once they had confirmation of what was actually potentially compromised, they released a joint statement through the OAIC. So then on the 21st of June, we determined that the breach was also notifiable. Um, we did call the OAIC to determine whether we did have to go through the notification process. They were very helpful in walking us through this. There is some guidance on the OAIC website that states that if there's more than one entity that has been involved in a data breach, that only one entity needs to notify. However, in this instance, it was a little bit confusing for end stakeholders, so the applicants. Um, so many of the users in our recruitment system, they might have not even been aware that they were affected by the page that breach. Um, so in that context, we decided that we were going to notify individuals as well, just to make sure that they were aware of what was going on. Um, so this included notifying via email around 86,000 affected individuals, quite a few people, the following day. Um, we then formed a response team to deal with any queries that came through or any concerns from our um, prior applicants. So this included myself, the cybersecurity manager, and also somebody from HR, one of our HR business analysts, to make sure we had a consistent approach to responding to all of these queries. This was in part because we thought that there was three possible avenues that they could have gone down if they were um, if they were concerned. Two emails were included in that, the actual communication through to the affected individuals, so cyber security and myself. And we needed to make sure that we were consistently responding to them. And if they had actually emailed multiple stakeholders, making sure they had one contact that they were going through. So we had about, we only had about 70 people actually contact us with concerns. Most of them were actually requesting that their information would be deleted from page up and our additional databases as well. So it wasn't as bad as what we what we actually thought, but making sure things were consistent was really key in dealing with how we approached that. So lessons learned. Once the initial um, period of response was decided and slowed down a little bit, we conducted a lessons learned meeting to understand what we could have done a little bit better. So First of all, communications. Uh, communication is absolutely key. So 
first of all, was paid up. Paid up were really forthcoming with their communications to us, which assisted in the notification process. Um, however, in saying that, it's very handy to be aware of the guidance that some of the others were providing. In being a third party, there was quite a few people who also notified and each of them had a little bit of a varied response in um, how they were advising their individuals to deal with the, the breach. So in this instance, some companies had actually notified individuals that they could alter their profile themselves and delete the information on the profile themselves. But this wasn't something that we had in our, um, in our profile and it may have caused some frustration to some of our users. So internally, we have quite a collaborative working relationship with cybersecurity and HR. Um, so we were really easily able to form a team to respond to this situation. Um, and have a unified response to, to our queries. Also by using our incident and crisis management response, we were really clear on who was responsible for communication, both to our applicants and to the regulator as well. So we only had one person speaking to the OAIC to make sure we had the same approach the entire way through. So secondly, our flexibility and response. So we really need to understand the interplay of the other various legislation. So in particular, this time round, it was the State Records Act. We're required to retain the applicant information for two years after a job has been filled. Um, however, this legislation isn't widely understood by the public. Um, so you need, really need to understand that you ensure you understand the retention requirements and have a flexible response to those who do want their data deleted. In this instance, where people were really concerned, we archived their information on some of our internal systems um, where their information couldn't be just hard deleted by the applicant's request. And most people were quite happy with that. Um, thirdly, use the available resources. The OAIC actually has some really good tools on their website. And we did call them on numerous occasions to get some guidance on the notification process. This was the first time we'd, have, we'd actually had to do it. Um, they also assisted us on making a call on whether to notify or not. Um, they helped walk us through how individual stakeholders would actually perceive this data breach um, and what was going to be required as a notification process. Also, the, the notification tool on the OAIC's website was actually really easy to use um, and really helpful. Then lastly, make sure that you examine your contractual arrangements. So one key thing that we probably could have done a bit better is having had some of the data retention elements in our service agreement more tightly refined. Um, so many of the app individuals on our notification list had applied through to the university many years ago. So we probably could have reduced the number of notifications that we actually have to make. Ideally, so the more information that's unnecessarily retained, it, the greater the risk it is if you, if you lose it and the greater the administrative burden as we learned. So then one of the, the biggest learning points overall was how interlinked privacy is with many of our other processes across the university. Um, it's really key to have privacy by design as an approach to ensure situations like this are responded to in a timely manner and ensuring your staff across the university are comfortable with escalation and communication of potential privacy breaches. Uh, and I think that where we have our notifiable data breach plan as a sub plan about this crisis management framework also indicates how seriously we take these issues. Um, so this also ensured that we had that our communications to external regulators like the OAIC, they're consistent and they're also in line with our reporting requirements as well. And just picking up uh, where we've left off, uh, a great presentation there on PageUp and Macquarie University. Uh, we're going to be talking in this session about the rights of people to control their own data and whether that is an individual consumer a small to medium enterprise or large business, or actually a government entity, it's all about data rights. Now, where does that data reside is a very important question. Uh, who stores it and how do they store it? And what kind of agreement is used to transfer that data between say, uh, the consumer and the business entity and potentially one business, 
business entity and another, and even a business entity and a government. Um, and that kind of uh, third party transference is what we're talking about in this uh, era of open banking, of which our next speaker will be talking about. We'll be looking at data portability uh, as stipulated, for instance, in the GDPR and also in the Australian consumer data right uh, law that's uh, being proposed. How does consent work between a consumer and a third party? Uh, how, you know, and what rights does the consumer have uh, to know about what data is stored on them? And we're not just talking about personal information, we're also talking about data about relating to consumers. And so we looked at, for instance, the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica scandal. Sure, consumers can actually download all the data that they've offered up freely uh, on the Facebook platform. But how that data is proactively profiled, how it's matched up with third party information, wasn't actually made aware to most of the Facebook subscribers on the platform. And when individuals started making requests uh, about their data and its uh, proactive profiling or relationship to advertising, and some would say manipulation, uh, they found out a lot more. For instance, some people uh, were identified as having 5,000 data points related to their personal information. The other question is how we treat sensitive information in the consumer data right, uh, who the accrediting companies are to allow for that transference of information and how they become accredited, uh, what consent actually means, uh, whether if a company, for example, uh, has 250 or more employees and is uh, doing business with the EU, whether they are keeping adequate documentation on the actual databases they are storing of personal information or other information. For example, uh, the type of attributes, uh, how long that's going to be maintained for and why it's being kept and how that uh, information may be shared with other third parties. All this information uh, now has to be documented in good security profile practices and that's what it's all about. The better our security practices are, uh, the more we can say uh, there'll be less harm on individual consumers. Now, on this slide, I have identified business data rights and also government data rights. In the US, for instance, government data rights are as pronounced as consumer data rights, although most people don't believe uh, there is actually adequate privacy here in the States. So a government data right um, usually takes the form of licensing. Governments don't actually um, own or have titles to data, but what they do is they offer licensing schemes, particularly for technical data and computer software. Uh, and they may contract out to a small uh, organization and say, we are going to actually um, license this out, although it's an exclusive relationship. But back on the consumer data, right, uh, increasingly, we're going to see utilities wanting to have data portability to ensure perhaps the best uh, price on offer for that individual subscriber uh, and to be able to compare prices between one you know, provider and another. Companies will have to abide in the consumer data rights by three things. The privacy safeguards that are stipulated in the bill, uh, the Australian privacy principles, and if they do business with the EU, the GDPR. And how to segregate that data will become important to prove and have evidence that actually uh, the company is abiding by uh, the consumer data rights. So I'll probably leave it at that um, in summation to give our last speaker some time to talk about the movement towards open banking. And just to say one of the things that is occurring is that possibly the blockchain may well be uh, one way to facilitate uh, the accreditation and the transference of data between uh, third parties and uh, consumers to have the right to know what is actually being stored about them. Thank you. What I'm going to cover is um, looking at particular the, the issues arriving out of um, quote unquote open data and particularly questions about um, re-identification that Anna's already uh, touched on and questions about informed consent that uh, go to that. But um, I'll be probably presenting a slightly more sort of critical view than um, some of the others, I start off um, as, as someone who's um, had some exposure to the Health Research Ethics Committee. I've sat on that sort of briefly. Um, I've also done reports for the New South Wales and federal 
um, governments about sort of open data and those risks. Uh, helped the uh, foundation of the Centre for Health Informatics and the Data to Decisions Cooperative Research Centre. So, you know, I'm um, not a sort of a that much of an outsider in the sense of um, I'm not being exposed to this, but I, I do probably come from the uh, consumer, citizen, or civil rights advocate sort of perspective, and um, I think it's um, important for people on the the uh, inside of uh, the data using um, community, particularly in, in research, to um, be aware of their, uh, I suppose, strict legal compliance obligations, but also. Um, this is an area where trust is extremely important and trust depends on being trustworthy um, and the, the the real issue is if um, you do something that ultimately ends up um, hurting or compromising or damaging the interests of data subjects uh, that you're working for then that trust disappears um, very uh, quickly and so um, there's a, an element of this that's about sort of compliance and you know, uh, you know, reasonable sort of business and and uh, sort of research behaviour, but there's also an element about um, being aware of the potential for um, the loss of, of trust to uh, have quite serious consequences for um, both individual research projects, but also um, the the capacity to um, sort of continue um, after a, a particularly large disaster. Um, um, the next um, question I'd like to touch on, a sort of a preliminary one, is about the terminology and the use of uh, sort of framing words to, um, I suppose, guide or focus uh, how people think about uh, what they're dealing with. Um, uh, there's a, a, a very brilliant um, short uh, work called Don't Think About an Elephant by Lakoff, L-A-K-O-F-F, where um, he um, talks about the, the use of words uh, to essentially win the debate before you even start by, by framing um, what the sort of mental image or the sort of the narrative is going to be all about. So the, the particular sort of words that I'm um, uh, concerned about here are open, as in sort of open data, um, sharing, which is um, a, sort of a concept that's been uh, popularised by, uh, say, Facebook, and also to a lesser extent, the idea of rights. Now, I think um, essentially the, the, the problem is that um, um, we are not in a fair fight. We're not in a, uh, a reasonable, open sort of discussion about this. We're in a, a sort of a public sort of domain where the what's known as behavioural economics or the sort of nudge theory of government that sort of to some extent uh, came out of uh, some uh, British uh, developments thinks that um, it's okay to push people in the direction of doing something that you claim to be sort of beneficial without necessarily having an, an open conscious sort of uh, rational sort of argument about it. If you can just make them more likely to do what you want then that's fine. What this um, ends up in is the, the fiasco that we see now um, with the My Health record, which is not actually a clinical record. Um, there, the, you've, the, the concept of consent um, is um, abused because there's, it's not informed and there's no consent um, involved, but um, the, a lot of the messaging behind it, or rather the, the reluctance to have a messaging that says what it is and what it isn't and, and to discuss any risks, those sort of things that normally you would expect with informed consent in a, uh, you know, a medical or a research sort of context. Um, the justification for um, quite manipulative use of language and of, of messaging is um, on the basis of um, you know, the behavioural economics units um, trying to use nudge tactics just to get people to sign up. So um, my, my, I suppose, caution is um, that, that that is not an isolated incident. Um, when we hear of something described as open data, it's a brand that's designed to sort of discourage, I suppose, critical thinking about um, what it is. Um, and in, in, in the same way, sharing, in a sense, that's um, use and disclosure without necessarily having the consent of, of, of the individual. The open data is often um, da personal information that's been weakly de-identified and republished without the, the, the host taking responsibility. Those sorts of, you know, much longer and less snazzy titles are more likely to point attention to um, the sort of risks and problems you're dealing with, but they're anathema to 
those who want to essentially use it for PR purposes. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop the rant uh, on that topic. It, it, what, what I do want to say though is that um, the use of terms like open data and sharing are not neutral, they're not necessarily accurate, they are sort of part of a um, an attempt to um, normalise some of the um, activities there which when you look closely may, may be um, problematic. Um, when we look looking at um, open data, um, there is um, many types of data in, in the report that um, I did for the Commonwealth um, you know th there's lots of stuff that are not sensitive information that are not personal information that is um, it's absolutely fast fantastic to use the sort of uh, ideas from the open um, source software movement and open content movements of, of encouraging um, sort of more relaxed um, sort of publication and use of that sort of information rather than um, insistence on traditional sort of strict proprietary rights to, to lock things down. Um, the problem comes around um, when you look at the sort of information that should not be um, essentially published to the world um, as quote unquote open data and the, the obvious one would be personal information. Um, recently we had a visit from the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on uh, big data and, and open data and at the uh, the forum at that it was, it was generally um, conceded there was just absolutely no basis for publishing um, personal information. The the the, the real area of um, a dispute was was basically um, to what degree uh, can you ever justify publishing um, unit level data derived originally from personal information from individual medical records. Um, obviously this is um, the sort of thing that uh, a lot of the um, proponents um, want to do, uh, and there are there are beneficiaries of, of this sort of publication. Um, the, the problem from um, my perspective is that uh, um, the uh, re-identification risk that we'll get on to in just a, a second actually is a very serious and profound and long-lasting um, problem that's only getting worse and so uh, in that forum at the UN Special Rapporteur I mentioned there was a, um, a, a consensus starting to form the, of the need for great caution about um, in a sense deprecating or perhaps starting off with a presumption against um, publishing unit level data derived from sort of personal information. Um, I, I know th this is a, a realm of um, um, continuing sort of discussion and con controversy but um, uh, probably the, the, the message that you might take about sort of open data is essentially to do an audit and a, an analysis of the risk profiles of the different sort of information, um, particularly focusing on um, the possibility of um, re-identification and uh, essentially um, you're doing triage, you're saying some of these things are pretty well safe, they don't need much attention, there's, there's, there's no sensitivity risk to that data there's other information that should be left right out and just not touched and uh, um, there's the category in the middle that's potentially sensitive information that's been, um, uh, there's been a, a de-identification process that's gone on but there remain question marks about the effectiveness uh, and that's what I'll talk again um, uh, uh, at the moment. Just before I get off the open data um, as a general concept, um, uh, to me, I would suggest in your thinking about it, rather than using the sort of nudge and framing term open data, think of it as poorly de-identified personal information. If you're lucky, it might be okay, if not, not. Then That raises the question of risk and so another point before I look at the detail of the question of uh, de-identification is um, the nature of risk and risk management. It's, um, and the, the, the concern that I have here is that uh, um, the by publication of um, information as open data you end up with um, risk projected onto the data subject. That risk is often uh, intangible, it's often um, uh, unclear what it is, it's often a very complex set of circumstances that might manifest it. Uh, the person may never know about that, they may never appreciate uh, the harm or, or discrimination against them or, or other sort of uh, consequences that may come from that. So um, um, if you are saying 
can I get away with this? So this is the, the sort of Facebook or Google model of move fast and break things and, and disruptive innovation and you know not wanting to be responsible for stuff. The bad answer is yes, you can probably get away with it because they won't know. Um, the, that to me suggests that you're not trustworthy. If you're trying to take advantage of your greater control and power and knowledge and the ignorance and sort of I suppose lack of um, technical capacity on the side of the data subject then you know you're someone who's dangerous I mean you you will get away with it so Facebook um, for a long time got away with it until one day they didn't um, and so the, the, the danger is that um, if your attitude to risk is that uh, um, uh, you know because it's ambiguous and uncertain and, and complicated to sort of see how the harm would manifest um, and you know we can probably escape we're not planning to do an audit we're not asking we're not going to to, to check for years and years whether for instance the de-identification is broken um, and we think you know we can get away with it I'll personally be in another job those are some of the things that uh, um, seem to come out of some of the reviews that, that I did then that's really quite dangerous on the other hand um, if you are, um, recognize that those are the things that drive the risk and make it worse, then that may, may stop you from going much further. Um, uh, just mentioning um, re-identification, the big problem is that um, it's not a one-off thing. Techniques that were, were reasonably effective in the past to make it you know, difficult to reasonably identify the person afterwards, to re-identify, um, are likely to fall one by one, particularly with the advent of big data, uh, advanced analytics, machine learning, neural networks, artificial intelligence. All of those techniques um, mean that what was once accepted as probably good enough in terms of de-identification, it's no longer there. Now, Anna mentioned that in Australian terms, it's not absolute. What I would suggest is that, you know, that yes, that's true, but the likely risk of future re-identification is only growing. And unless you have a, an engagement with the global debate about this sort of thing, and unless you're monitoring and auditing and sort of projecting into the future, then it's quite likely you have a, an under-appreciation of that. Um, the final um, thing I might just mention in passing, the data sharing, uh, uh, and Bill and the consumer data right, the issue there is there is no right from, for the individuals to sue for a breach of privacy. And so these uh, I see as very hostile attacks on what should be um, re remedying that great hole in our privacy law, the fact that you can't sort of pursue that. Um, uh, the right for the, the consumer data right, that's likely, although it's presented as a right, it's likely to result in pressure to do that um, uh, sharing. And so um, it, it doesn't, and none of those things um, look to me like um, they're starting off from a respectful or trustworthy position. It, it sounds like um, the, the, they're quite comfortable not to have any of the um, um, remedies, but particularly the right to sue for a breach, to be the platform that would give um, people rights to, to you know, use the law that exists already. There are sort of a way around that to ignore um, uh, individual data subjects' uh, current uh, weakness. Anyway, look, f forgive me for taking up so much of the time um, and, and thank you for that. Uh, one person has asked, is there a source of truth for which countries are GDPR affected, one that we can rely on to be updated if countries leave or join? Um, I might, and this is Anna, I might answer that. So the, everyone is potentially GDPR affected. So um, the GDPR is all about the European Union and there are 28 member states in the European Union and you can just Google what are the countries in the European Union. It also directly applies to the three countries that are in the European economic area but not in the European Union which is Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein, just to be confusing. Um, but the the whole point of the GDPR is that it is supposed to have extraterritorial reach to anywhere in the globe, to any organisation that is actively trying to capture data about people who are in one of those 28 countries. So it's not about um, the citizenship or the residency of your customers, it's where they physically are. So um, in terms of privacy rights, any of us Australians who go to Italy on holidays, when we are in Italy, we are in the EU and we have privacy rights under the GDPR. And if an Australian business is actively trying to target us while we are on holidays in Italy, it will have to comply with the rules under GDPR. Um, so there's no definitive list of countries where 
the GDPR applies other than to say every country in the world if that organisation is actively trying to collect or use data about people who are physically in one of the EU countries. And it's, okay. it's pretty, it's right, Anna, as well, that uh, it also depends on where the equipment, the data equipment is storing the information. Uh, is it in the EU? Is it outside the EU? And uh, we did see a few companies try to flee Ireland, for instance, uh, very recently, uh, just to escape actually the GDPR uh, because it it took its servers out. So we, we are seeing very interesting manoeuvres by large transnational corporations uh, taking pieces of equipment, hardware that store information, consumer information out of the area. Oh, the okay. only thing I add in, into that is that uh, there's also the pragmatic end of it. You're finding that a lot of the large data giants in the US um, or and some of the smaller businesses, cloud businesses, are recognising that in effect the GDPR has set the global standard. The US has, has sort of uh, vacated the field that they have not attempted to um, produce sort of comprehensive rights that in, in a sense apply to other people. And um, many um, industries and businesses are uh, looking at this and saying, well, we'd better try and comply with the GDPR as best we can because basically we could be touching on Europeans at some, somewhere, so we could be that sort of technically subject to that legal jurisdiction. But in any case, um, everybody's heading that way and it makes it simpler and we'll have less trouble if we do, you know, we've got to do it for someone, so we might as well do it for all. So in practice, there's, there's a larger effect than just the narrow specific compliance jurisdiction. And we've also had a question around, um, I guess it's related to Brexit really, does the GDPR apply to UK and will it in the future when Brexit is completed? So that's a really good question. So right now it applies to the UK because the UK is one of those 28 member states. Um, the UK has flagged its intention to keep complying with the GDPR and act as if it is one of those countries even after Brexit. But what they haven't yet negotiated is how the UK will be treated by the remaining countries in the GDPR. Because one of the rules under the GDPR is all about limiting um, the cross-border transfer of data. So let's say from Germany to England, will England become a third party country like Australia is, transfer of data from Germany to Australia, um, and have to start jumping through hoops to allow that transfer to take place. So um, the UK Information Commissioner's Office is actively trying to negotiate that with the European Commission at the moment, but at least their intention in the UK is to keep applying the GDPR as its form of domestic privacy law even after Brexit. Okay, um, one other question was about the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme. Uh, someone asked if we know of any other universities that have proactively adopted the scheme like Macquarie has. I know that there was quite a few universities that were affected by the page up breach and Macquarie was certainly not the only um, university that notified as part of that breach. Um, are you aware of any other universities that have uh, implemented that or if anyone is aware of any, um, could you pop it in the question box and we'll be able to read that out as well. Oh, no, I'm not. Fair enough. Um, so uh, if there's any other questions um, that we didn't get to, um, please put them in the question box or, or and we'll uh, address them later through a um, Q&A document. Um, but I'd just like to thank all of our speakers for making time to um, come and speak to us today. It was a really interesting um, set of talks and I think that the importance of proper de-identification and consent really came through quite strongly. Um, related to that, um, the new national statement on ethical conduct in human research um, that's owned by NHMRC um, came out recently, the revised version, and it has um, some things to say around identifiability of data. Um, and so that would be another place for people to have a look. Um, and uh, there's some uh, new requirements in there around data management and sharing as well. And um, we had a webinar on that last week. So if you're interested in that, please check out our recording. Um, and I'd also say around um, open data and personal information um, that 
um, the five safes framework um, that uh, was developed in the UK and now is being implemented both in the UK and in a, some Australian government um, agencies and some other places um, where they're um, looking at not only um, making data safe through some process of de-identification but also looking at a more holistic picture of who is accessing it, where are they accessing it um, and are the um, uses for which they're um, proposing to use that data appropriate. That five safes framework is a really great um, framework and it's also um, uh, being proposed to be used in the new government data sharing and release legislation. So I think that's another um, really great uh, Thing to have a look at in this area. So thank you very much to our speakers and we will be sending out our recording and um, our resources and slides to everyone who registered after this. So thank you for attending.